Okay, this is Stefan Kinsella. I'm here with uh, Mr. Williamson Evers, who I've never met in person, and uh, he has graciously agreed to discuss with me um, a topic that I've been interested in in a number of years, the uh, title transfer theory of contract. And uh, Mr. Evers, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. So I'm uh, Bill Evers, Williamson M. Evers. I'm a Stanford PhD in political science. And I currently am a research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, I was a friend of Murray Rothbard for many years and discussed political theory and philosophy of law questions with him, including uh, questions about the law of contracts. So I think that's what we're going to discuss today. Absolutely. And um, I'll just observe that uh, I've been a fan of the Journal of Libertarian Studies, of course, since its inception. And I noticed that I think your article was the very first article um, ever published in the JLS. I think that's you were right. in volume it was one, lead, number one. It was, it was the lead article in volume one, number one. Yes. And you've had and several was, others. Uh, yes. And I was also the managing editor for a while. And um, I think your article came out in 1977, and I'm, I'm a lawyer, and so I've written on this topic, and I've been interested in it since I've been uh, studying Rothbard and uh, libertarian theory. And um, uh, this theory has been fascinating me for a long time. Uh, my impression, and I'd like to get your impression, is that it's been – it's got a lot of potential. It could have more development, and it's underappreciated, and I think it's revolutionary, to be honest, um, in legal and libertarian theory. Um, just in tracing the genesis of the idea, it appears to me that around 1974, I think your article came out in 77, around 74, Rothbard had some sketchy thoughts on this in one of his earlier articles. So my guess has been for a while that you and Rothbard were discussing this, and you wrote it up into a longer piece, and then Rothbard drew on that in his Ethics of Liberty chapter, which relies heavily upon your 1977 article. Is that basically what happened? Do I have that right? I think that's basically right. Um, so this was a long time ago. So you and I are talking in 2014. Correct. Uh, I specialize in kindergarten through high school education policy these days, mm -hmm. and I'm not writing in this area anymore. Understand. I'm not saying I would never write in it anymore, but I haven't for many years. Uh, I, I wrote, in addition to this article toward a reformulation of the law of contracts, I also wrote on uh, social contract theory yes. in political thought, and, and so that's a related area. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to – your, your question really is about the genesis of this, and uh, Murray Rothbard and I used to talk on the telephone uh, late at night. He was kind of a night person. And we would talk quite long times, you know, maybe even hours sometimes. Uh, in sort of the early days when I knew him, he didn't really like to travel very much, but he loved to talk on the telephone and have people in his apartment, he and Joey's apartment in New York City. But anyway, we used to talk about things, and I was a graduate student in uh, political science at Stanford, and I had to write papers on various topics. And so I, uh, I tried to utilize the obligation to write <laughs> serious papers uh, to also explore things that I thought were underdeveloped in uh, political philosophy of classical liberalism and. So I did, uh, and I, and this is really not something I'm completely certain of, but I believe that I discussed it with Murray Rothbard, uh, that you know, certain insights that I found in a very fragmentary way, a very scattered way in different writings of his, uh, and that he encouraged me to develop these further. And so Stanford has a great law school with a great library. And I just dug in and sort of the first thing I realized was that 
uh, utilitarian ideas about expectations have had a huge impact on the way the law of contracts was discussed. Um, you know, like a lot of things, and this is something that you is reflected in your own writing, there are different ways that sort of end different ways of approaching a topic that kind of end up with a similar result. So just because this focus on expectations was there didn't mean that the law of contracts was, you know, completely wrong headed or hopelessly wrong or something like that. But it meant that it wasn't thought about in a way that was compatible with a natural rights private property oriented classical liberalism. So uh, I looked around and I found various authors who, you know, I, I read things on all the different sides of this and I found out what are the issues, what are the controversies, what are the controversies that are interesting to libertarianism. And I tried to find out how had previous people thought about it and how to press those thoughts on further and, you know, try to systematically go through the issues. And that's what I did in this article. And Professor Rothbard thought it was a pretty important article. That's why I use it as a lead, the lead uh, piece in the, in the new journal. Um, and I agree with that. And when I came across it and Rothbard's uh, uh, restatement of it in Ethics of Liberty, um, it sort of blew my mind as a, as a lawyer. As, as you saw from my piece, I'm from the civil law tradition in Louisiana. And um, there they distinguish uh, contractual or conventional obligations as either to do or to give. Okay, so that's the conventional way, of, the, the typical way of looking at it. And from what I realized from looking at your and Rothbard's work is that pretty much every conventional legal system and contractual system can be boiled down to really an obligation to give, which is really not an obligation to give. It's just a transfer of ownership of property. So to me, this whole right. approach um, rests upon an essential insight that all rights are property rights and that all property rights are rights and scarce resources and the right of ownership is the right to control it and one of the aspects of that is the right to convey the title to someone else and that's really what contracts are i mean is that the basic approach that you would agree with yes but uh i do, i do think we have to be careful about include the right to convey because I think that the natural rights tradition in uh, classical liberalism says that you can't uh, sell yourself. Correct. You can't sell yourself into slavery. Now you could, let's say you found a guru or a religious figure, or you joined a monastery where there was absolute uh, rule by the head of the monastery. Uh, you could dedicate yourself in a sense. You could, you know, you could make yourself servile, but you could. They couldn't um, hold you to it. They exactly. couldn't enforce the contract. They couldn't hold you captive as a slave, legitimately, in terms of natural rights, uh, libertarian philosophy. So, uh, the, and, and uh, you know, the the whole superstructure of libertarian philosophy of law is built on dealing with the situation of free human beings in a society with scarce resources, as you said. And so, you know, you, you are then that superstructure, the rest of it, the conveying the alienable property, uh, you can't sort of take that superstructure and use it to destroy the foundation, which is the free person operating in the material reality of the world. So I just, you know, it's like sawing off, you're out on the limb, which is a superstructure. You can't really destroy the, tr the trunk or the roots and, and say, oh, well, that was a legitimate move. 
Right, and which is why my I, I, don't, I hope your listeners haven't got lost in the metaphor, but all I'm saying no, is... my my listeners love this kind of stuff, so that's that's fine. Um, okay. My my feeble attempt to build on your work and Rothbard's was in my article. The one reason I had I thought I had to deal with the in, the whole inalienability issue was because of exactly what you're talking about. Um, I right. don't know if you agree with all of that approach, but it seems to me that. Um, um, we have to treat property rights in one's body, which is euphemistically or uh, metaphorically called self-ownership sometimes. We have to right. treat that differently than the acquisition of property rights and scarce resources right. that are previously I, I agree with that. I agree with that. So I, I did have some differences with your paper, but I thought it was a serious paper, and I'm not, you know, so – sectarian as to condemn you to outer darkness or something over the differences because i think it's a very interesting article that you wrote uh i you know i have some thoughts on different aspects of it um which i'd be glad to make I, the yeah, focus of the rest of our discussion uh but you know i just want to mention to listeners to this that again this is not the area in which I'm doing research and writing today, but you know, I, I, you know, I can recall what I think and thought about it. So as I went through it, um, I thought, you know, you know, first of all, you're kind of recapitulating uh, what Professor Rothbard and I, what Murray Rothbard and I had to say, but you're also partly talking about your foundational views of what justifies libertarian philosophy. And you're, I guess, attracted to the argumentation ideas of Hans Hoppe. Am I correct in that? It is, but I don't think these ideas rely upon that. But um, Right. That, that I don't true. think they do either. Yeah. And so I would want to state that. I myself, uh, you know, I – I'm more of a Aristotelian Thomist in the way that Professor Rothbard liked to modify that and the way that Doug Rasmussen and mm -hmm. Denial mm -hmm. set this forward. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that's a pretty good. Uh, similarly, Henry Veach is another mm -hmm. man that I mm -hmm. think highly of. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, but I don't oppose the argumentation idea, which has a kind of a more Kantian cast to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I think, developed very well by James Sada Father Sadowski, mm -hmm. James Sadowski, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, Professor Rothbard also liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I view that as not in conflict with an Aristotelian mm -hmm. Thomas justification of property rights mm -hmm. and of human liberty, individual liberty. Uh, and so we're not antagonistic, but I just thought <laughs> I would say that uh, I think they're compatible, but I think that I, I say I, I think I find one is more of a thin justification, and the mm -hmm. other is more of a thick one, and I'm just more comfortable with a, a, a well, thick one. one. But I oh, also okay. think in arguing with other people, it's good to have at your disposal a thin one because it's easier to talk to people. It's just kind of an what what political philosophers call an imminent critique because mm -hmm. you're saying to somebody, well, if you, you know, think that uh, you can uh, do this, how can you even say that you think people should do this if you don't own yourself in order to open your mouth exactly. kind of thing? And exactly. so, so that sort of in caricatured form, the, the essence of the argumentation argument. And, you know, I think at a minimum, it, it ought to make people pause. So I think it's good, but I just think I want to kind of go deeper. Now, I think you make a good point that Professor Rothbard and I seem very, like, standoffish about the word or term promises. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're very... Mm -hmm. You know, you you use like the phrase that we're fixated on it. That was <laughs> that was probably probably we're, too harsh. We're kind of writing yeah. in we're kind of writing in reaction. I understand to uh, legal theorists that made a lot out of mere promises. Exactly. But I think you're you're quite right in saying that if the substantive effect and intent 
of a promise is to convey title, uh, then it's, you know, quite a good contract, and it would be so under libertarian thinking. Right. So I, I and then that is your point, and I agree with it. But I mean, I also think, and you would, you're kind of in our conversation here, acknowledging that you're understanding that we were reacting against this um, kind of cavalier, breezy use of promises. Of course. With quite a substantive effect in the people that we were arguing against. Of course, and um, and I'm happy to let you talk about any of this, but my, my point was not to get you to comment on my paper. My paper is just an indication of my interest in this topic, and I'm really interested in um, a few things about I, – I don't know if you've paid attention to or if you recall some of these, um, the little minutiae. So Mr. I don't know. I don't know where we. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. We got cut off, but I'll I'll, I'll fix it. Um, okay. So what was I saying when we stopped here? Well, I was. I'm trying trying to remember. Sorry, I was distracted myself. But um, what I was saying was, um, I I just wanted to ask you a, a couple of um, uh, things that have stood out to me in this debate. First, I wanted to get your impression. Um, well, did you did you hear me saying? That uh, let's see now. We talked about the promises thing. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So then I wanted to go, and I before I did it, I wanted to say that I appreciate once again. I appreciate you writing the article. I think it's a serious article, and just because we have differences doesn't mean I'm you know, condemning you. <laughs> Some well, I, 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 I don't – uh, But anyway, the first thing I wanted to discuss was this issue about the existence of something that might be owed in the future. Exactly, and I actually did want to turn to that. I wanted to so, kind of – So I wanted question. you to kind of state your view, and then I would react to it. So, uh-huh. so that's and that's fine. And, and and let me be clear. This I wanted to get your views. I really wasn't trying to seek your commentary right. in my article. I'm happy to if you want to do use that well, as a framework, and that's fine. Um, but yeah. I'm, I, I I was trying to talk to you about what you've written, and I wanted to get sure. your insight about the process and what your thoughts are on the development of this theory and how much is left to be developed and. Believe me, I'm not a critic. I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, I think there's something right. to be developed. That's all right. um, so yeah, I wasn't trying to be critical in the article. Uh, there's a few. <laughs> there's a few things. Well, I, was I think trying Randy to... Randy Barnett, although he's you know, this has not been the major focus of his uh, writings. He has uh, made additional contributions on it. I agree completely. And I think I think that. Uh, you know, I think that that's another person who has written in this. But in a sense, you're you're right that uh, hasn't been a lot written on it. I wonder. There's also a uh, professor at Stanford named uh, Marcus Cole, who's mm-hmm. an expert on bankruptcy, mm-hmm. and I have not explored that much of his writings on this, and I don't know how much he draws on this. Mm-hmm. He's certainly familiar with Randy Barnett. I don't know. <laughs> he knows about my writings on the subject, but well, anyway. I'd be happy to look uh, into he it. Might, I mean, obviously, bankruptcy is a strongly related to contract, and uh, and it's related to this issue that we're talking about now, which is whether uh, someone who is called upon to perform or transfer something in the future whether that if that thing is not in existence, what is the status of the contract? So, I mean, my my view is um, that you know, if you committed to something that's a legitimate contract, even if you don't have it, let's say you know you're supposed to have a certain amount of money to give to somebody in the future, and you don't have it, uh, that doesn't. It's still a valid contract, and if you if you're not if you're if you don't have it or you're withholding it or hiding it somewhere or something, well, that's uh, or you you give it to your best friend at the last minute. It's still a valid contract, and you owe the person 
the money. Uh, so then part of the question that arises is, well, if it's a kind of theft, why couldn't she be put in debtor's prison or exactly. why shouldn't she exactly. be? And I think that's a very valid question to raise. But I think, uh, and I, I know from your writing that you're not satisfied with this, but I still think, and I'm, again, I'm open to argument on all this, ex except for the fact I'm not writing on it anymore. So, um, but anyway, uh, I think, you know, there are gradations, just as in robbery. There's robbery of your house when you're not there, and there's a robbery when you're, you know, you're there. There's in the streets, there's robbery with, uh, you know, a gun at, on you, and there's robbery where they just snap and snatch and grab. So I think just as there's that, there's different kinds of theft, and there's lesser and greater theft, and it would be uh, disproportional to the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and you know the amount of intention that's involved and so forth. This all affects the gravity of what has been done to you. I'm talking about you, the victim who didn't get paid back. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's part of why I don't favor debtor's prison and I think you know, no one can speak for Murray Rothbard anymore but I think that similar ideas figured in his thinking uh, again I, I, I just think it, you know particularly um, with specific unique items uh the idea is very troubling. <laughs> Let's say you have the Mona Lisa, all right, and you sold it to me, but the delivery is supposed to be in the future. Uh, so at the last minute, I give it to somebody else. <laughs> That's crazy. Mm -hmm. You have to be still liable to turn over the thing that you owe. Right. So I, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm kind of flippantly giving this example, mm -hmm. I and mean, it's a much more subtle topic. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's that's my view. Now, there's another issue that you don't really get into very much, but I think is a complicated one for this theory and is an area that deserves additional, you know, additional research program on anybody who writes in this in the future. And that is uh, the slavery equivalent onerous damages issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the examples, I agree to sing, uh, I'm an opera singer and I agree to sing in the San Francisco opera and then when the time comes, I don't show up. I'm off drunk somewhere or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. whatever. So, uh, or I just decide I don't want to do it. So. Can somebody compel specific performance? Well, you and I both agree, no, they can't. But now what about um, a performance bond of some sort? Mm -hmm. So I put forth some in the contract made with me to come and do the singing. I say, well, if I don't show up, I owe uh, $5,000 mm -hmm. or $7,000, some number that's maybe even more than what I was going to be paid, but it would be enough to make me want to show up there. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, what if it were $1 trillion mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, or mm -hmm. something huge? Now, you might say, well, of course, I, the opera singer, don't have the $1 trillion, mm -hmm. so that's how maybe you take care of it. Mm -hmm. But if someone doesn't agree with you, is there another problem here? And the question might be, is it the equivalent to slavery? Is mm -hmm. the burden mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, you know, like I will chop off your leg or, I will, you know, I'm not killing you and I'm not, you know, whatever, but something that is so onerous that it makes it equivalent to slavery. And I don't, you know, because I'm not writing in this, uh, I don't have a quick answer, mm -hmm. but I do think that this is an area that deserves further uh, research, further writing, sensible writing. Well, I've, I think um, it's a realistic, a realistic 
issue. Well, the the way I've interpreted your theory in Rothbard's in my Misesian, Rothbardian, Hoppian way is that okay. it's all about transfer of title, and theoretically you could engage in a future title transfer, which say to a debtor, which basically transfers every piece of property that you ever acquire forever, uh, yeah. even a piece of food going into your mouth. And if you did that, right. it would be equivalent or tantamount to a type of slavery. And so maybe some argument like that could be used to justify some type of bankruptcy uh, type of provision, which I think is getting at the same insight that you're – yeah, um, talking about yeah. here, but, and, but I don't, I don't. So I am uncomfortable with this idea that uh, you could convey everything, including every you know morsel of food and drink of water correct. in the future. But uh, but anyway, the point that we're both getting at is that this is an area that deserves further exploration, and so I. I'm uncomfortable with the whole idea of bankruptcy, and this is why maybe Marcus Cole has something to contribute or future other future people that maybe aren't born yet. Who knows? Uh, so, so generally, um, you know, the idea of bankruptcy is you say, I can't pay, mm-hmm. you know, and I want to start over. And mm-hmm. then the law makes various provisions, and it might make a homestead exemption and whatever, whatever. I am not really comfortable with that. I think you still um, you still owe the money, and you can't just get out of it. And I'm I'm really troubled. There are people, even people that might claim they're libertarians. <laughs> I don't want to get, I sound like I'm getting into a big heresy hunt here, but during the last um, financial crisis with all the homes going into foreclosure and things like that, there were people going around advocating that people who were having trouble paying their mortgages just walk away. Walk no, away. Well, You'll be better that's, that's off. That's the title you're, of, of Doug your book, so-called... I think, right? I think that's the title of his book, I, Walk Away. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, they were telling people, even though you've made this contract, you made this money, now you're underwater, as the phrase goes, just walk away. And the system has already built into it an expectation that a certain number of people will walk away. So do it. I, I I don't agree with that. I think that's, well, well, uh, l- l- let me so let anyway. Me... So that's that's a, an area that I think needs. Uh, and again, you know, I'm not writing in this area, but I I it troubles me and seems to be against libertarian uh, values. But I'm open to argument as exactly. I am with everything. Well, it seems to me that uh, the terms of the contract matter and the terms of the contract that would be in force in a free society matters because the terms of the contracts in today's law may be influenced by the political climate and the laws that exist right. so right. it's hard to have a, a pristine approach to this but um let, let me if you don't mind let me get your opinion so, so so one of the other things that you try and do to address some of that is you pose uh different um you know, you could have additional provisions like to provi- to provide for the case in which the person doesn't have the money. And in a way, you're kind of, as I said at the beginning of this interview, you're trying to get back to the point that, you know, you don't really want people to get off scot-free <laughs> without doing what they owe. And so you are trying to kind of recover this to some extent. I'm trying I, to get – I wanted to also – Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I also wanted to compliment you that I thought you'd uh, done a good statement of the abandonment issue. So this is a potentially tricky issue because um, okay, I've got to I've got to turn this off. I have to turn you off and talk to you later. Uh, okay. Take your time. You're talking about the abandonment issue. Yeah, um, and this is this is related to 
a lot of what we've been talking about. So if you can acquire property and do it through uh, systematically making it part of your projects and the phrase that we often use is homestead it, uh, you also have to be able so – so you're marking it, you're setting out boundaries, you're systematically mixing labor with it and so forth. You also have to be able to abandon it. Um, so this is complicated because you have to make an objective, recognizable, overt thing showing your intent. It's a little bit tricky, and this is another area where further, uh, you know, writing needs to be done on this. So, so let's take the Love Canal case, okay, which is sort of not as bad as, you know, as was shown in Reason Magazine many years ago. The, the government was all mixed up in it, but we'll just call it some pollution thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've created this pollution thing, and uh, then you walk away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, then maybe nobody occupies it, but let's say it bubbles over mm -hmm. or it's emitting harmful rays or it's somehow has a, some kind of geyser effect and it's mm -hmm. spraying out into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and falling on other people. Mm -hmm. Can you just, you know, abandon it and say, this is not my property anymore? I, I don't think so. It's just like, I shoot a bullet. Well, in a way, I've abandoned the bullet, but the bullet well, or, keeps or going you, and it hits it somewhere. Are you planning so land, you plan a landmine or something like that that explodes right, ten years right, later and exactly. kills someone? Yeah, yeah exactly. There's a call. Right. There's a call. Okay, but anyway, there's room for there's room for more writing and thinking about this. I agree completely. Then I then I think you get in interestingly into the uh, issue of inalienability mm -hmm. and punishment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, so to explain this a little further so let's so let's say we're in agreement that there's that people are inalienable they can't sell themselves but their material goods maybe intellectual goods this is another whole topic that I don't want to get into but anyway there are material goods that are alienable and that people are transferring titles to and so forth. But now let's say you commit a crime. Okay, in punishing you, uh, a restitution effort might, you know, take what you have mm -hmm. or it might compel you to do something to restore mm -hmm. to the other person mm -hmm. or it might imprison you. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's a retributive punishment mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. And libertarians are divided among mm -hmm. – classical liberals are divided among different punishment theories, but mm -hmm. certainly the most common are rest restoration or mm – -hmm. Uh, and and retribution to mm -hmm. kind of balance Re the scales. Of rectification, so, right? Rectifying the right. situation. Mm -hmm. Right, rectifying in various ways. Mm -hmm. So this might and then impinge on the idea that you are inalienable and that people can't compel specific performance from you. I agree. Uh, so I think this issue, which you raise, and uh, is one that needs further discussion. And uh, you know, I, I, so I think that's an area that. Uh, well, let me, if you don't mind, let me ask uh, you. So, so I'm I'm kind of through my thoughts on okay on the whole thing, and I do need to call back the person that was calling me there. Well, let me let me thank you for taking your time to speak with me, and uh, I really right. appreciate what you've done. And uh, I, I don't know if you're interested, but I'd be happy to speak with you just personally in the future if you're interested. And uh, I really appreciate what you've done in the past, and um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great endeavor. And so um, I will thank you for your time, and I will let great. you go, and I will send you a copy of everything, and we can talk about it before. Okay, anything well, I authorize, you to, I authorize you to um, post this and uh... – in whatever form you want to. So, Thank you, Mr. Okay. Evers. I appreciate it. Nice talking to you in person.
Thank you. Good. I enjoyed Bye. it also. Bye-bye.